how would I define a, a God-centered church? Well, I've, I've thought about that, and I've thought about it. I believe a God-centered church is, is doing the business of God's way, uh, of God's word, doing his way for his glory. Amen? It didn't have anything to do with a man. It's not a business, a run on business principles. It's run on, it's run on biblical principles. Amen? We're not a corporation. We're a congregation. We're, we're not something inanimate. We're alive with the Spirit of God. We're a church that wants to follow the unchanging word of God and not the ever-changing whims of, of mankind. A God-centered church is a church that exists for the glory of God, not the ego of man. A God-centered church is a church that is not, a, it's not treated like a country club. It is, it is treated like an army, and, and Almighty God is our commander-in-chief, and we march to his orders. Amen? God-centered church would be a church that marches by what I, I call our marching orders from Matthew 28, 19, and 20. It says, go therefore and make disciples. Notice the word go. Go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And that's why I want to call this series a church on the go. We need to be a church on the go. That ought to be, that ought to describe Grand Cane Baptist Church. And so today, I'm going to be talking about let's get up and move. Let's get a move on. How many times when you were growing up as a, probably some of the older generation here, when you were growing up, Dad or Mom gave you a task to do, and you kind of lollygagged around a little bit and piddled around a little bit, and pretty soon Dad comes in and he says, you better get a move on, boy. I remember as a young boy being raised up in the body shop. My dad had given me a job to do. And uh, typical 9-year-old, 10-year-old boy, you know, I'm, I'm easily distracted. And, and uh, I, you know, I might be doing what he told me to do, and all of a sudden there's a bug crawling across the floor, and so I want to play with a bug, you know, and, I'm, and Dad walk in, and I'm not getting my job done, and, and one of the things he, he'd always say is, boy, you, you better get a move on. I, I think the, the Lord may be speaking to the church today, saying, get a move on, church. Now, I don't know what that would look like, but... I certainly want to be that, amen? I want to be a church on the go. Acts chapter 1. Let's look at Acts chapter 1 today. But I believe the key verse is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where he says, You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. And then as you study through the book of Acts, which is an action book, amen? Uh, Acts is it's, it's full of action. It's not... It's not for sitters and, and lazy people. It's for people that want to get up and go. People want to do something. And, and if you look through the book of Acts, you'll, you'll find that it, it happened exactly like he said in verse 8. You will be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and Acts, is, uh, Acts 1 through 8. You, you watch the church move out from Jerusalem to Samaria, and then from Samaria, uh, which is the, the, the Jews moved to the Gentiles, chapters 9 to 15. And then if you look further in chapter 16 to 20, you'll see where the gospel then goes to Asia. So now you got Jerusalem, and the gospel now is going out to all of the unknown world. And then you get to the last few chapters, and that's where the, you see the gospel goes out. It's when Paul went to Spain and and the gospel went out from there. That's kind of a pattern. If you look at the book of Acts, it's what you're going to find. So my, my question to us today is, in relation to uh, the, the commission, which is Matthew 20, 19, and 20, to go and make disciples with the example that the apostles set for us in the book of Acts, how are you doing today? How, how, is, how are you doing as a Christian? How are you doing when it comes to being active in spiritual growth in your personal life? But not only in your personal life. 
How are you doing when it comes to being active in serving others, active in ministering to others, helping others along the way, blessing others, sharing your faith? Or, or could it be that some of us maybe have grown a little lazy? We've, we're, maybe we're tired and we're a little bit lazy and we, or maybe we've become a little stagnant in our faith. You know, we've just kind of grown to such a, a certain level and all of a sudden um, we, we stopped. And it's like being in a stagnant pool of water where there is no fresh water coming in and old water going out and you become stagnant and begin to smell a little bit. I fear that there are many in the church who have become a little bit lazy. Well, Acts is a book that says, what are you doing? Don't just stand there. Get up. Get a move on. It's the book of Acts. And so I think if you're kind of stagnant in your faith a little bit, if you're a little stagnant or lazy in your ministry going out, I think you need to study the book of Acts. It will encourage you. It will inspire you to get up and get a move on. So, there are two historical facts that the writer, who is Luke, um, points us to. Luke begins by introducing these two historical, uh, what I call, turning points. And these turning points actually launched the early church into its mission. You see, we do have a mission, right? For some reason or other, you know, when Jesus said, we're to be salt and light of the earth, we, we're, we've salt all right, but, but it's all inside the building, and we become so salty we can't stand ourselves. When he says, we're to be the light of the world, we're, we're light all right, but the light stays within the walls, and we're so bright inside that we're blinding ourselves. The salt and the light need to go out into the world. That's what mission is all about. That's what the book of Acts is all about. It's about a mission of the gospel going out to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, Luke was a doctor and a historian. He writes about a lot of things in the book of Acts. Persecution. He writes about a lot of miracles. He writes, uh, he even gives us some history on the church. Uh, in, the, in the days when he first began to minister in the church, he tells the story of how the church grew in grace and grew in faith by the work of Holy Spirit and the power of Holy Spirit. He talks a lot about Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And anytime I see uh, the, the book of Acts, I, I see a, a, an, action, an, an action of the gospel going out in every chapter. It's the gospel going out. And sometimes I wonder if the church has lost uh, a little um, insight We've lost a little bit of our vision about going out. Well, read the book of Acts. Jesus, he talks about first these two historical turning points is the ascension of Jesus. Look at the first three verses of Acts chapter 1. Notice what he says. I wrote this first narrative, Theophilus, about that all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up after he had given orders through Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Now, we know that Luke wrote the book of Acts. He wrote the gospel according to Luke. And he addressed it to this person named Theophilus. And we don't know a whole lot about Theophilus. In the book of Luke, he addresses him as the most honorable Theophilus, which would tell me that obviously Theophilus was probably some high-ranking Roman official who had come to know Christ. And so Luke Luke probably was discipling him in some way. Notice what he says. Oh, by the way, his name means one who loves God. Says an awful lot about him. In verse 3, he says, after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. What did Jesus come on the scene talking about? The kingdom of God, right? Right? What did John say when he introduced Jesus coming on the scene? Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And, and he, talked about, he talked about the one who would build, establish the kingdom of God. 
Jesus would say, now is the kingdom of God being built. And so, the ascension of Jesus, uh, look if you will in verse uh, four. While he, was, uh, while he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. So, here he is. After he had suffered many things, he says in verse 3, he had presented himself alive to them for some 40 days. And just as he talked at his, at his first coming about the kingdom of God, he spent the next 40 days talking about all that he'd begun to do, giving further instructions on the kingdom of God. You see, he didn't just show up on Easter morning and say, hi, I'm out of here, and he left. He was here for 40 days preaching and teaching those apostles that he'd called, teaching them what they must do from hereafter. Now, you say, well, huh, I think the, the Great Commission was given to those 12 disciples. Or Acts chapter 1, verse 8 was meant for those 12 apostles. We would be pretty naive to think that those those 12 men would live long enough to take the gospel from, from Jerusalem to Judea, from Judea, Samaria, Samaria to the uttermost. How, how foolish would that be? The Great Commission was given to the church. Amen? You and I as the church, uh, the, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, that, that, is, that, that is for us. We will be witnesses. Notice what he says. He says, when you receive power, when, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, you will be my witnesses. Now, here, here's the question. You are his witness, but what kind of witness are you for him? Because you don't have an option in the deal. You are a witness. And you... You're either a good witness, you're either a positive witness, or you're a very negative witness about the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? But you are a witness, whether you want to be or not, you are. We all are. We are witnesses. Notice what he says. Let's go back to our, he says, for 40 days he gave many convincing proofs. Listen, he didn't just appear to the, the Marys that morning at the tomb. He didn't just appear to those 12 in the upper room shortly after his, his resurrection. But he appeared at one time, Bible says, uh, a crowd of over 500 people. He gave many convincing proofs that Jesus was alive and well. No doubt about it. And in those 40 days, he was constantly instructing his disciples about how to carry the gospel out. The second historical turning point was his, his giving of the Holy Spirit. Look, if you will, in verse 4 and 5 again. While he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. Now, here's... Jesus is giving his church that, that is to be a church on the go. He's telling them to wait. Well, why did he tell them to wait? Because he knew, he knew that I'd be just like them, or they just like me, that if he didn't tell me to wait for something to happen, that I'd probably be just going back to, to Galilee and pick up my, my nets and get back on my boats, and, and life would be just as it always has been. So he told them to wait, wait for something, wait for something very significant, the coming of Holy Spirit. Notice that he says, wait for the, uh, for the Father's promise. This he said is what uh, you heard from me, for John baptized with water and you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Hmm. You, do you remember when, when, um, John baptized Jesus, and John said he wasn't worthy to loose the sandals of the Messiah's feet. Jesus said, 
Jesus told the people, he said, you're baptized with John's baptism. John says, the one who comes after me, he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire, right? Here's the fulfillment of that. When Jesus, when the Holy Spirit came after Pentecost and indwelt his people to empower them for the work of the ministry, for the mission to go out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost. Notice, well, I'll tell you what, let's go back to, I, I want you to see this. Let's go to John chapter 16. In John chapter 16, Jesus is, uh, he, he's just given them a world of instruction from about John chapter 14. Uh, where he tries to comfort them. He's telling them he's going to be crucified. They're alarmed. They're, uh, they're a little probably feeling a little discouraged and a little confused. So he's preaching. He's teaching them. And he gets to John chapter 16. And look, if you will, in verse 1. He said, I've told you these things to keep you from stumbling. In other words, he said, I want you to walk tall, keep your head up, well, be, be uh, confident. Everything's going to be okay. I'm, I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you. And then he says, they will ban you from the synagogues. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering service to God. Who is he talking about there, maybe? Paul, the apostle Paul. Paul thought he was Saul. Paul, he thought he was doing God a, a service by killing Christians and imprisoning them, stoning Stephen. He thought he was doing a great service to God. This is what Jesus was making reference to, those who would be like that. And then he says, they will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. But I have told you these things so that in their time uh, comes that you may remember I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. Jesus was saying, I, I, I didn't tell you all these things because I was here to answer your questions. I was here to give you direction. I was here to give you instruction. But there's coming a day when I won't be here. And you're going to need to know and understand. Notice what he says. But now I'm going away to him who sent me, and not one of you asked me, where are you going? Yet because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away, because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. Who is the counselor? That is Holy Spirit that he's about to speak about. He says, if I go, I will send him to you. I want you to notice something here. I will send him to you. Who's he talking to? Who's, who's Jesus talking to here? You think he's talking to his disciples? He's trying to prepare them for what is about to happen in the crucifixion. He is trying to prepare them for what is about to happen. He's telling them, when I go, I'm going to send him to you. He didn't say I'm going to send him out into the world. He doesn't say he's going to be a, a, a cloud. He doesn't say he's going to be a mist. He said, I'm going to send him to you, not just to the world, but I'm going to send him to you. When he comes to you, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Now, have, have, you, ever, have you ever read that and thought, I don't, I don't get that? When Holy Spirit comes to the believer, he indwells the believer. Our commission is to go out and spread the gospel. And the only way it can have any power to change lives is, is if that message is empowered through you by Holy Spirit when it goes out. You cannot do anything apart from the indwelling Holy Spirit. You are helpless. He, he is the only power, the only source of power that we have available to us to accomplish the will of God. That is the indwelling Holy Spirit. So, oh well. Let's move on. So then he says in verse, where did we leave off? 
Look at verse 7. Let's go back to verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. Why did he tell them that? Because in verse 6, he says, so they'd come together and they ask him, Lord, why are you, uh, uh, you are restoring the kingdom. When are you restoring the kingdom of Israel? Are you going to do it at this time? And Jesus says, hey, he says, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has sent by his own authority. In other words, he's saying God is sovereign. What? God is doing things the way God wants to do it. It's, it's not, it's, he didn't have your permission, he didn't have to have your okay, he didn't have to have your counsel. God does things the way God does things because he's God. He's sovereign. Whatever he says is the way it's going to happen. Now, he, he, here, here I see I, I, so, some problems with some of their understanding. Notice what he says. He says, not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father is setting in his own authority. That's his business. He says, but you will receive power when Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. After he said that, he was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight while he was going uh, they were gazing into the heaven and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come again in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Here was the problem. Let me back up here. Where did I go? Call to be witness, the, the ascension. All right, here was the church's mid, uh, uh, mission, 10 and 11. We just read that, and his return. Now, forget about losing all that, because I just, that messed me up too. Here's what I want you to see. Notice what he's, their question is, have you come to establish the kingdom now? Here was their problem. You remember I said there's three problems. First of all, they thought that establishing the kingdom was going to be immediate. And, and no, it wasn't going to be immediate. It was going to take time. The gospel was going out. It wasn't going to happen overnight. They thought it would. The reason they thought it would was because they thought the kingdom of God was for Israel and Israel only, not all of the nations of the people. They thought it was Israel. That was it. They, uh, they thought God was going to wipe all the Gentiles out, and it was about the Jews and the Jews alone. But God said, no, it is about the Gentile world also. So they thought it was immediate. They thought it was Israel only. And they didn't understand the sovereignty and the authority of God and the timetable of God, that it doesn't happen overnight. And aren't you glad? Listen, if it had happened overnight, none of us would be saved. If it had happened overnight, none, none of your generations that come after you will have an opportunity for salvation. Uh, the reason that God established the church, saved us and established us, he left us here was so that we would reach the world for Christ. I think it's time that the church got up and got a move on. Amen? So, so, Notice what he says. He says, in your Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. Let, let, let's, let's get out of the known world at that time. Let's get into our world. What is your Jerusalem? Isn't it your family? Are, are you actively sharing the gospel and sharing your faith with family? With your, grandchi your children and your grandchildren? I appreciated what... Uh, Sheena was talking about this morning in Sunday school class. She was talking about her young son, uh, Bowen, and how he's got all of these questions. And, and, and she wants to go deeper with Bowen and his understanding of the scriptures. And, and more specifically with what we had just been talking about the past several weeks of the unseen realm. And, and how if you understand uh, the, the unseen realm and, 
and the demonic oppression that is all around us, if you understand what's going on, how much that opens your eyes and your understanding of the scriptures and all of what Jesus did, not just his death on the cross, not just his burial, not just his resurrection, but you would, we, would, we would understand to a greater degree all of what Jesus did, all of what he accomplished in your behalf and mine. And sometimes she, she just said, sometimes I, I want to kind of back away from that, and then I think, no, that's what happened to me. People backed away from, from the truth and the whole truth, and that's why I, I don't know as much as I should by now. We, we need to be teaching our children the truth of Scripture. As far out as that may seem, we need to teach it. So, well, I'm not going to teach my, my kids about all the blood baths of the Old Testament. Why not? Don't, don't you think you need to be teaching your children the truth rather than the world taking that and teaching them a lie? We do. We need to teach our kids. That's our Jerusalem. Our Judea, that's, that's our neighbors. I, I, they're, they're probably, I don't know how many of us have neighbors right across the road, but many of us have neighbors right across the road. Ha, have you ever bothered to walk across the street and, and, and just try to build a relationship with them so you could share your faith with them? That's what we're here for, amen? That's, that's why we're here. We're here to share. God left us here to share our faith about the glories of of Jesus Christ. Amen? Are you sharing with your neighbor across the street? Our Jerusalem, Judea. Where's our Samaria? Our Samaria is our workplace and our community. Listen, Grand Cane uh, does a lot during uh, the, the seasons of the years. We're, we're about to enter into a very festive season in Grand Cane. There's car shows coming up. What, what else we got going on, Anne-Marie? There's Spring market coming. There's always something going on. Grand Cane Baptist Church ought to be there when something's going on. We ought to be there. We ought to be there hand, handing out bottles of water in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? We ought to be out there sharing our faith. That, we ought to be out there reaching our Samaria. And the uttermost, huh, that's where we are right now. We're in the uttermost of, of, of the the days of Acts, we're in the uttermost part of the world. But where is our uttermost? Our uttermost is in the missions that we get involved in. We go to Belize from time to time. We've got, uh, we've, we've got a trip to Vietnam very shortly. We've got a trip coming up to Alaska going short. You say, well, I can't go to Vietnam, and I can't go to Belize, and I can't go to Alaska. Well, we got a work day at Clara Springs uh, Baptist encampment on May the 11th. That's missions, and you can go. Amen? You say, well, I, I want to be involved somehow in Belize, but I can't go. Well, the, the way you do that is by giving to support those missions. And then you have a part in the gospel and the missions of the church are going out. We need to go out. Amen? Not come in. We need to go out. Well, let me hasten to say, let me just make four quick applications. We are called to be witnesses. Amen? You agree with that? So you need to make a decision here today. What kind of witness are you going to be? Are you going to be a positive witness or are you going to be a negative witness? Because you are, one way or another. Secondly, we must witness in the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, <laughs> have you ever tried to tell someone about Jesus or about the Bible and, it, and, and you just said in your spirit, this ain't going anywhere? Th this ain't happening. Well, probably because Holy Spirit is not involved in that. Amen? So, so sometimes you, just, you have to be uh, attentive to um, Holy Spirit. You've got to be sensitive to his presence. You got to be sensitive to his call, and you got to listen to him, and and he'll open those doors, and he'll progress with the the witness and the faith and the gospel if you'll depend on him, because you can't do it apart from him. 
So we witness in the power of Holy Spirit. John, Jesus told us in John, that's why he's coming, to give us the power to go and carry out the Great Commission. Historically, the gospel's already moved from, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. Here, here we are in the uttermost, right here. And it don't stop here, amen? It's got to go out from here. And the last one I just talked about. We need to think in terms of our own Jerusalem and our own Judea and our own world. Now, this message about, has been about this. We, we, we've got a job to do. It's the most important job in the world. It is the most important job in the world. Amen? It is. Because... The, the, the job that we have, the mission that we have, the word that we have, it imparts life, eternal life, to someone who is destined to hell, eternal separation from God. I would say that gives it priority. The most important thing we can do is share our faith with lost people. Why are we not bold about that? Why are we so cowardly with that? Are we afraid someone's going to make fun of us? Are we afraid somebody's going to call us a radical or a fanatic? I think we are sometimes, aren't we? We need to think in terms of our own Jerusalem, our own Judea, our own Samaria and the world. I'm proud of my wife because <laughs> she has several family members scattered all over the world. She talks to them on the phone, but she will never let them hang up without sharing Christ with them, never. I'm, I'm sitting over there listening. I'm thinking, they're going to get tired of hearing this. They're going to get tired of hearing this. Do you know what her attitude is? They can always hang up the phone. Yeah, they can always hang it up. <laughs> but I'm proud of her. She will share her faith with a post if it'll stand still long enough. And that ought to be what we do, amen? 